Thanks for listening to In the Game with Elliot. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on the latest episodes. Welcome, everyone, to episode four of In the Game with Elliot. I'm Elliot Georgiatis, and this week I talked to Mike Yam, who is currently an anchor with the NFL Network and I'm convinced is just one of the friendliest and funniest guys in broadcasting. So, Mike Yam, thank you so much for making the time to do this because not only are you the NFL network anchor you're also doing play-by-play for intel you've got serious xm radio gigs going you also do some stuff for uh quick hit news don't you you have a lot going on yeah it's been it's been busy um which is a good thing it's a blessing it's awesome yeah. to be with you by the way i mean this is terrific yes. that we can connect well, via you. zoom and like technology and the whole thing that's that's yeah. going right now uh no look elliot i always say this man as long as the check is clearing like that's a win <laughs> um so if the checks keep coming I, i'm ready to work um but no honestly i've been insanely fortunate uh especially over the course of the last you know year plus with covid and situation mm-hmm. that happened to me at, at pac-12 network which uh i was not necessarily anticipating when my contract mm-hmm. wasn't renewed and um, you know you almost feel like you're starting from scratch so I know a lot of people are, are looking for work I have friends that are in the business that don't have jobs so um, insanely grateful to uh, to have the work that I do have well like I said you have so much on your plate I'm glad you made the time to do this and I really appreciate yeah. it although this is like extra great timing because I wanted to get your thoughts on what happened yesterday since you spent so long covering collegiate athletes with the Pac-12 yeah. network I wanted to talk shop a little bit with you and ask you what you thought about the Supreme Court's ruling regarding collegiate athletes in the NCAA. I love it um, in a big way. I, I've been a huge proponent for years for college athletes to be able to capitalize on their name, image, and likeness. I think it has been uh, long overdue, decades overdue uh, for this to actually to come to fruition. In fact, I was doing a radio show this morning, and I think I still have my notes up here. Let me just kind of scroll through. I think one of the things that was really fascinating is some of the comments from the Supreme Court justices. And I'm actually yes. going to pull up, uh, actually hit the wrong button there. Um, I, there was one line in particular, and I'm like furiously um, scrolling through to try to find it. But the point is, and of course I can't find no, it because we're on, okay. you know, we're doing this live and I should probably have this. Oh, oh. here we go. Here we go. All right. Love it. Live when I scroll fast <laughs> and my page just refreshed on me out of the blue. So I'm going to pretend like this is not the case. I'm going to reopen the page. I'm going to stall for some time. But Kavanaugh okay. basically had said something to the effect that the NCAA is full of you know what, and the things that they have been doing for a really long period of time are not appropriate. In fact, he said, quote, the NCAA couches its arguments for not paying student athletes in innocuous labels, but the labels cannot disguise the reality. The NCAA's business model would be flatly illegal in almost any other industry in America. I absolutely love it. Couldn't agree Mm -hmm. more. And it is about time people make some extra coin on the side. By yeah. the way, that's the longest answer to whatever your question was about this. But no, it wasn't. No, nope, because I have follow-up I... questions. So that wasn't oh, okay, long cool. at all. But okay. I agree with you. I thought it was interesting because one, unanimous. Two, I read that as well from Brett yeah. Kavanaugh. Like he had very, very, Hammer very, down. yes, strong opinions on that. Um, when I was listening to some coverage on it yesterday, the language everyone was using was that they cannot bar or limit education-related benefits. So it's supposed to be this very not a huge step, but this is a step right in towards giving some sort of foundation financially to athletes sure. that are giving so much to their university, but they're letting the NCAA still determine what an education related benefit is like, how, how far do you see this going, I guess, in the next couple of years? Yeah, this is, I mean, it's a million dollar question because I think there's so many different tentacles to this story because I think when you couple NIL with the transfer portal, which is becoming more of a chaotic situation for a lot of student athletes, there's so many different ways to analyze this. Number one, on the portal side of things, when when a student athlete decides to go and leave his respective school in the hopes of finding greener pastures, they punt on that scholarship that's coming their way. And it's a conversation that we've had a lot over the last few years 
what do you do? I mean, if you don't find a home, because the reality is there's more kids in the portal than there are actual spots for them on campuses. So now all of a sudden, one of those massive benefits that you made reference to in a full scholarship, poof, like that is now gone for them. So I think that's one massive issue that needs to be um, discussed and cleaned up from an NCAA perspective with regard to the portal. Now you focus in on NIL. And I think number one, how many kids go to a different school now, maybe put themselves in the portal with the thought that they might be able to capitalize on NIL a little bit more. I, I don't know how realistic that is, but I do think for some that might be a factor. You got college recruits that are coming in with you know tens of thousands, 50,000, 100,000 followers on social media. With that brand yeah. comes a significant amount of power that they can monetize. I don't know enough of the the financial side of things when it comes to YouTube, but like what would stop some student athletes from creating YouTube shows and doing those types mm -hmm. of things? Like there are revenue streams that they're going to be able to capitalize on. So I, I think that there's, there's a lot here, um, a ton to unpack. And certainly we can spend the entire podcast talking about that stuff and happy to do so. I wish I had more of these answers, but I know for a fact, there are so many more creative people than I am that are going to be able to come up with, with things and ways to monetize these student athletes that we haven't even thought of yet. So mm -hmm. I think from a creativity standpoint, we're going to see some really interesting things over the next few years. I love that I was able to ask you about this today because you haven't just covered sports. You've really spent a lot of time closely with these student athletes and that's a whole different world. And you're seeing firsthand the things that they're going through. And your point on social media is one that I hadn't even thought of because the star power that they have has been so enhanced these last yeah. few years because of what they're able to do on social media. So I didn't even really think about that how that might influence their decisions. Because again, somebody else I was listening to today was talking about how this might end up influencing things like the NBA's G League. And how is that yeah. going to change the nature of that, given now that student athletes might find it more appealing? Because they, I mean, they've struggled with that anyways, kind of, sure. haven't they? Yeah. And the choices that basketball players in particular, I think, make. But I'm curious to see how that ends up changing things on that end, especially if this door gets widened further. Yeah, what's the, what's the cash, right? Like, I think if you bring up the G League, it's a good example. And I think there's been a few players, not a ton, that have decided to go that avenue instead of playing college basketball. We'll keep it in the basketball terms. I don't know. I, I, I would imagine the conversations have been there are very few student athletes that can make significant money and monetize their name, image, and likeness. And I think to a certain degree, I believe that. But I do think it opens up the door so we can have a conversation on, on women's sports, right? Like to me, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming you watch the NCAA tournament in women's mm -hmm. basketball, I was definitely monitoring it really closely. I was doing shows on Sirius XM surrounding it, but who wasn't watching Ari McDonald? I mean, she yep. was the biggest star in during the tournament. I, I think you can make an argument on women's or men's basketball. I mean, she was mm -hmm. terrific. You know, we were spoiled. I say we because I used to, you know, follow her really closely when I worked mm -hmm. at Pac-12 Network. But she was a spectacular athlete. Now, when I see Magic Johnson, when I see and then insert like famous person tweeting about her performances, I go, man, like she might be one of those few student athletes that are going to be able to monetize or would have been able to Sabrina, certainly when she was at Oregon, like yes. there's like that, that certain category upper echelon. But I think when it comes to football, you're still going to see, I think just more student athletes that are able to do it um, as a whole. But I do think that football players specifically, there's going to be more of them that are going to be able to, to make some money. And I don't know what real money is, right? Like, is that a $5,000 appearance <laughs> right. fee? Is that, you know, 50 K is it, Hey, do I make sure I got some cash in my pocket so I could take a girl out on a date, you know, as, as a football player, you know, like those are the types of questions that I think are still looming around this topic. That's a good point too, because that's a whole other sticky situation in terms yeah. of getting down to the nitty gritty. Like, how do you, what is going to be the bar or the level that's set for that kind of stuff? But there should well, be really, no level, by the way, I don't think there should be a bar. So we're all in hell. Yeah, man. If, if someone's going to go and pay me X amount of money, that's what, that is what the standard is. And that's what the going rate is. So I think it is absurd because I've heard the argument that, that you brought up, like capping it. Some people say, oh, they should cap the figure. Hell no. I mean, we live in the United States. This is you know, you got to do, you got to do what, <laughs> what, you know, I, I don't set the market, the market sets itself. So whatever someone's yeah. willing to pay, 
I, I think that is the going rate. So I hope these athletes get, get everything coming to them. Oh, see, this was perfect timing today that yeah. we're getting to talk about this Let's because roll. you were totally the person that I thought, gosh, it'd be so great to get his perspective on this topic. And then yesterday happened and I was like, boom, that would there be a great is. thing to get yeah. to ask my gam. Um, but getting back then into your background a little bit more, cause like you mentioned, you were at PAC 12 for a really long time. It's not where you started though. You actually didn't even start in television broadcasting. You've had kind of an interesting career path to get to the point where you're at right now. Uh, you started in radio. Give me the backstory a little bit. At what point did you decide this is it sports? This is what I want to do for a living <laughs> late in life. I could tell you that. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Cause it wasn't like I was like, you know, I was still in college at the time, but you know, I, I mean, I wish I had a cool story that I was a kid that was calling play by play, you know, when I was going to my games and video games and in the backyard in the playground, like that just wasn't me. I didn't even know that that was an actual job. I spent my childhood, my high school days, certainly the first few months of my college uh, tenure thinking I was going to be a pediatrician. I wanted to be a doctor my entire life. I thought that was going to be the path for me. And after one semester at Fordham, that was not going to be the path. So then all of a sudden it's like this reset, like you're freaking out, like, what am I supposed to be doing? What's the calling? People already know what they want to do in life. And, you know, they're, they're, they're plugging away with some of their classes. And that wasn't me. I did have, you know, it's kind of amazing, just the little seeds that are planted in your life. And once again, I thought I would be a doctor, but I, I, the media thing was always intriguing. And at that time, like now it's, you know, got Sanjay Gupta on CNN. So like, it's, it's common to see doctors on television, but when I was a kid, you know, local news, there would be a doctor that would do a segment and it always kind of just stuck in my head a little bit. Oh, like maybe that could be something that I do down the line. And then I had um, a, a teacher in high school say, Hey, you have a really good voice. You ever think about radio? And my God, it never even occurred to me that my voice sounded anything. In fact, if I listen back to this interview, I'm going to cringe because I hate the sound of my <laughs> own voice a lot of times. But it's amazing, like just these little things that pop up when they plant a seed. And then my freshman year, when I was at Fordham, one of the guys on my hall, uh, my freshman dorm, he, he's one night wearing a suit and a tie and he's leaving at night. I'm like, you know, dude, not for nothing. When you're in college, someone's wearing a suit. It's either like a job interview or, you know, someone passed away and you're on your way to a funeral. Yeah. Like that was just not the norm. So I said, Hey, where are you going? And he's like, Oh, I'm going to go cover the nets. I'm like, what? Like, you're, what do you, what do you mean? You're going to go and cover the nets? He's like, yeah, I got, you know, a gig at the radio station. We have credentials. So now we get to cover some of the pro teams in New York. I'm like, Whoa, that's kind of badass. And after one semester of chemistry, I realized that the pre-med thing was not going to be for me. I uh, walked over to the radio station. I signed up. And then all of a sudden, you just kind of work your way through, you know, being a college kid and wanting to do this and doing updates and shows. And I got to cover the Knicks, which was my favorite team growing up as a kid. The Mets were my favorite team. I got to cover World Series. So we were initiated. It was almost like baptism by fire. We got thrown into the mix uh, in New York. And it was just, it was awesome. But all these experiences piled up and you know then all of a sudden your senior year comes around you start freaking out it's like all right where the hell am I going to get a job like all my roommates that already know what they're going to do it's either grad school you know they got the finance jobs that are already set I'm moving back home living at home like what the hell like I just did four years and I'm never going to work professionally and you start sending out your tape and or my cd at the time and sending it everywhere and you know sure enough like you get well pretty much you don't get any responses um you know it's occasionally you get a no and all it takes is just one yes and I got a yes and and things have just kind of fallen into place for me I always say and and legitimately mean this I don't know how many people you've had total on, on your podcast. I would imagine you're going to have like hundreds of episodes to follow. <laughs> I can guarantee you whatever episode number I am, I'm the luckiest one. So this will be the lucky number. I guarantee no one else that you're going to talk to is going to be luckier or have a better, well, I should say better, just feel more fortunate than I do in this business. Well, that's so great. And I love hearing that from you. Um, and I, I think it's so interesting that you talk about those little moments that stick to you because similarly, I didn't grow up in the stereotypical sports household. My yeah. father is, is Greek American and grew up yeah. with a bunch of Greeks and was, he was not teaching me the different positions on the football field on Sunday afternoons. We were watching Star Trek reruns and I was learning about the difference between NCC 1701 and NCC 1701A. <laughs> so it's interesting when you think you of those little moments. <laughs> Right. Yeah. But I think can be just as useful at times, no but doubt. No doubt. Uh, when I think back to college, same kind of thing. Oh, you're going to cover the Zips basketball game. 
I, I want to get to do that. And then wow. I joined the program. And the first time I did something on camera, it was Thanksgiving and I did a man on the street kind of bit. And we said, let's just ask people about their favorite Thanksgiving dish. And I ended up cutting together this montage of people talking about mashed potatoes. Yeah, And it was, it's so funny. Cause I was just talking about that this week. And that is the first time I was like, God, this is fun. So I think it's so great that you have that moment that sticks out in your head and that this is where life has taken you because of that, because yeah, nothing is a straight path. And no, you went from left to business. right to, I mean, like, yes. you, you know, I, you've been, you know, I know a little bit of your backstory kind of like zigzag. And I think everyone does that to some degree, you know, there's the more traditional path where you're doing a lot of market jumping. Like I, that wasn't my path. Like you mentioned, mm -hmm. it was radio. Like I backdoored mm -hmm. my way into television uh, by doing radio and working at Sirius radio at the time. And then ESPN radio, and then, you know, had some opportunities on the TV side. So you're right. There's no set path. And I think, you know, the interesting thing when I was at Fordham, we would have, you know, alumni or just pros come in and tell us their story. And I used to get so much out of it because I think the one thing that resonated with me, which is what you just said, everyone did it different. And there wasn't a set way like medical school, my whole life, right? It was, oh, you know, get good grades and you study in the, you know, you, you take your boards and you go to medical school and that, like, that's the path residency. And then your doctor, like this was, you know, just kind of figure it out, you know, say yes to every opportunity that comes your way. Um, don't mess up. And hopefully there'll be more opportunities for you. Don't mess up. Yeah. <laughs> really sound <laughs> career advice. So you're from the Newark area, right? I've heard yeah. you talk about being East coast guy, not just an East coast guy, New York guy. That seems to be something that is very near and dear Badge to your heart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was born in the Bronx. I grew up in Northern New Jersey. I went back to the Bronx for college at Fordham, uh, worked in Midtown at Sirius radio for a bunch of years and then moved eventually to Connecticut uh, to take the job at ESPN. But yeah, Northeast New Jersey, Jersey strong. Um, you know, there's some things, although I, I will be honest, I think my family now will tell you that I got soft on the West coast because it's been almost 10 <laughs> years. So I was going to say, have you drank the Kool-Aid? Yeah. I mean, life, life is good <laughs> out in California. I mean, just especially in, in, in the winter, like my cousins will tell me about the snowstorm. I'm like giggling. I'm like, yo, snow. Like I haven't seen that. <laughs> oh, I always think it's crazy because people in the Bay area, they go to Tahoe in the winter. And I always think that's the craziest thing. I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. You want to go and find snow? Like you want to go to the snow and everyone's like, no, it's different. It's powdery. And I'm sure it is, but I've like PTSD with like all the, like oh, the, I see snow and I think my back starts roots. turning. Yeah. Yeah. No. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Forgetting it. I'm, I'm definitely okay. Forgetting it. I do miss home. I miss my family, but that, uh, but lifestyle is definitely different. And you know, I mean, you, you deal with the seasons is cold by you in the winter. I it is Northeast Ohio. We definitely have our fair share of the snowstorms. Yeah. And I do, part of me is very nostalgic about it. And I love the season change. I have a deep appreciation for experiencing all four seasons, but when it hits like that, you know, end of January, early February, and everything is just gray, <laughs> it feels like yeah. there is no end in sight. You're kind of like, okay, are we, are we still doing this? Is this really what I'm doing? Yep. Okay. It's really, it's really what I'm yeah. doing. Yeah. But I think and you that's spent so some time in Southern California. So, you know, like that's a I different, did. that's a different, that's a different world down there too. It is. Like Northern and there's California, definitely, Southern is different. I would agree with you about that. Yeah. I would agree. Cause we have, I have family that lives in the Los Angeles area and I have family that lives in the San Francisco area. And when they, especially the San Francisco family, when they come to Ohio, um, back home to visit, if it's in the winter time, we are sledding, they are gearing up. The kids are like snow. They also, the Southern California kids yeah. though, get really excited about grass and basements because there's a lot of green and Ohioans have basements that. and that's where all the toys are. Mikey, yeah. I'm, didn't you know that kids keep the toys in the basement and you can't do that in yeah. Southern California. My, my basement in, in New Jersey when I was a kid was like creepy. So we didn't oh. have a finished basement. So like there was no toys, like that no would toys. be, that'd be a bad punishment. Like, Hey, go down to the basement and like, <laughs> Hey, no, no, no. Like, so it was a little different, but it's, you know, I, I got to be honest. I mean, that's kind of like one of the cool things, right? Like this, you getting back to like the sports thing, you just never know where you end up. And I, look, my first winter here, I got to tell you, I was making fun of everyone on the street. Everyone's bundled up winter coat. I'm mm. wearing like a little thin hoodie. I'm like, it ain't even that cold. Like, what are you guys talking about? It's, you know, there's no snow. It's not even, what is it on a cold night? It's like 55. Right. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, this is crazy. My second winter here, 
I was like having anxiety about going home for Christmas and seeing snow because like your blood, like that thing is real. And they talk about your blood thinning a little bit. So it's, it's a different vibe. Um, it's a great vibe though. And yeah, I got, I got used to it. <laughs> I oh, got used to it California. sounds like it. If it took one winter and you were already <laughs> apprehensive about the East coast. Well, anyways, back to the East coast. Yeah. yeah. You started off radio. You talked though a little bit, you went from Sirius XM, you went to ESPN radio. How did you make that transition then to the on-camera work? Was it intentional on your part? Like you were like, yeah, I'm going to start in radio, but I really want to get into television or did the opportunity just kind of present itself? You know, I didn't have tape. I didn't have really good tape to be able to send to get a TV job, but I had a ton of radio experience. So I just wanted to be on air. I wanted to do some sort of, you know, sports broadcasting, whether it was TV or radio. Clearly I I had, you know, I think most people would say like, I should say most, like for me, it was, I'd love an opportunity to do television full time. I also just kind of assumed the checks in TV were better than the checks in radio. (laughs) Um, so, you know, for me, it was just trying to find an opportunity, but when I graduated, I knew it, I didn't, I didn't have the chops to do, to get a TV job out of, out of school. So that's when I started applying for a lot of radio jobs. Most of them, I didn't get responses on. I got hired by a small station in New Jersey randomly to cover high school sports. I worked there for two weeks and then I quit because I got a job at Sirius radio to, to do work there. And it was like the, and that was like the, not that it was a smart move and I was intelligent for saying yes, but it was the best move I could have made because that opened up the door for just a ton of reps, a ton of opportunities. I got to do an all sports call and show um, Monday through Friday. I was doing NBA radio and then the NBA radio gig is what got me NBA TV because at the time uh, the league ran NBA TV and it was based in New Jersey in Secaucus. So Mm -hmm. it was not too far from Manhattan. Now it's based in Atlanta. Turner took over. And what had happened was they were using local anchors to do the bulk of their shows at NBA TV. The Olympics in Torino had kicked up and they only had two full-timers. So they had to have their two full-timers do their normal studio shows and they had no one else. So I get a call and they say, Hey, can you come in for an audition? I'm like, yo, all right, here we go. (laughs) And I go in for the audition. First time I had ever done anything like that. And I, I go in, I have no idea what I'm doing. I was probably wearing a suit that was like two sizes too big, you know, makeup, like what the hell is that? Um, no idea what to do. So I go out there, they give me highlights. I had never called highlights off of a shot sheet, shot sheet for anyone who's listening. Um, at most sports networks, they give you what's called a shot sheet, which has got a description. It's, uh, you know, the situation of a play, it's basically in columns. So if you watch Sports Center, they're using shot sheets. Um, the situation, the description of the play and the result. So I had never even seen a shot sheet before. I mean, I shouldn't say that. I was writing some of them when I was an intern, but I had never seen one on a set while I was expected to go and call the highlights. So mm-hmm. I do that. I do the best that I can. A couple of days later, I get a call and they're like, all right, like, can you do fantasy? Do you understand fantasy sports? And I was like, yeah, man, like I, I play in a bunch of leagues. So that's how I backdoored my way into television. I started hosting a fantasy show as a fill-in. And then I spent a few years there, got more and more opportunities to do studio shows. Opportunity came at ESPN, auditioned up there, which was insane. Um, got that job four years later on the move, Pac-12 Network, audition for that gig, also kind of a crazy audition experience. And uh, yeah, it's it really is wild. Like I circle mm-hmm. back on the same comment I made to you earlier, literally the luckiest guest that you will ever have on your podcast uh-huh. is me basically as I'm telling you the story. Well, I don't think any of that luck would come without your work ethic. Because like I said at the top, all the different things you're doing right now, it's clear that you have an incredible work ethic and that you're really passionate about what you do. So I think all those opportunities make a lot of sense and that you were definitely carving your own path. But I'm curious, tell me, because I've heard that the audition process that you're talking about is incredibly intense, like when you got in with the SPN. So what, what do they have you do? How long did that take? What was it like? Yeah. Uh, great question. Eight hour, uh, basically it's an eight hour day. So I drove up from New Jersey and I was lucky cause I was familiar with Bristol because what I was doing when I was working at Sirius radio was filling in occasionally on their overnight shows. So I would do like a four or five hour, uh, overnight radio show solo and then drive back to Manhattan and do Sirius radio during the day. Like it was great. Like there was some years there. I think when it was NBA season, generally I would, I would work six days a week, sometimes seven for a few months. I would do six hours of radio, NBA radio, a sport, an all sports call-in show, drive to Secaucus, New Jersey, 
uh, do NBA TV all night and then rinse and repeat. And then I was doing ESPN radio Sunday mornings on a fantasy show and then occasional fill-ins. But the point is I was familiar with Bristol. So I had a little bit of an advantage from that perspective for what that's worth. Like, you know, where the buildings are and, and you know how to get there and not get lost. Um, but they, they basically had called, I go up for the audition. It was, I don't I call it eight 30 in the morning. I'm expected to be in Al Jaffe's office. And Al was sort of like the, the patriarch for the talent office. He hired everyone and we get in there, you talk to him for 15, 20 minutes. And I'll never forget I was great. I mean, intimidating in the sense that you know how much power he has, like he can really change the trajectory of your entire life if he likes you and, and he ends up hiring you. And we had a good conversation. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget because I was freaked out, Elliot, that they would mess with you or mess with me on the set during the audition, you know, like take the prompter out, all that's, you know, stupid stuff. Ooh. And he turned to me and he said, Hey, I don't know if you've heard whether or not we mess with people during their auditions, but we don't mess with people during the audition process. We want to see you at your best. So if the prompter goes out, just know that that's not on purpose. Like we will re-rack. I'm like, uh, okay, mm -hmm. cool. So nice. from there, a couple more interviews uh, on the half hour. Then I got into their newsroom. Um, you get basically 30 minutes or so, something along those lines to prep two blocks of television, take it down to makeup. And this was kind of crazy. So I go down to makeup and I was used at NBA TV. I would do my own makeup. I still sort of do my own makeup. But at ESPN, they got like a whole team there that like does that stuff, right? So I get in and uh, I'll never forget. So Morning Sports Center um, had just started. So Hannah Storm, Josh Elliott, Robert Flores, I forget. Maybe mm -hmm. Sage uh, Steele was on one of those. But the point is, Roflo is out there. And I was a big fan of Roflo because I thought it was funny as hell. And it was great because like, what's really cool about some people in this business they understand like when you're going in for an audition, like you remember your audition. So don't be an ass. And like mm -hmm. Roflo wasn't Roflo was like, Hey man, like, don't worry about it. Like you got to get makeup to do your audition. So why don't you sit down? I can wait. I was like, uh, cool. Oh, okay. Wow. And like, you know, they take the airbrush and they spray your face and do the whole thing. And then it was the first time I got airbrushed by the way. <laughs> um, and then I, they take you out onto the set and you know, it's kind of crazy. It was the old, it was the old baseball tonight set. And a few people had said to me when they did their audition, it's intimidating when you go out onto the sports center set. And it definitely, it, it is the first time you do it, but it was still the same on the baseball tonight set. And, you know, I do the audition. And then from there, I had lunch uh, with Lori Orlando, who's now at CBS and, and Al. Um, and that was, you know, an hour or so. And then you do interviews on the half hour until like 5.30 or so. And it was, you know, an intimidating process. Um, and then a few days later, I, I got news. They were like, hey, you want to come up and be an anchor? And I was like, yeah. So we did it. And I moved up to Connecticut and spent four years there. Wow. It was cool. Yeah. Well, what a, that's such a great story too. And I love what you said about Roflo. And he was like, focus, you do this. Yeah. I'll talk to you in a little bit. Nice. That's really nice. And that's, I guess, speaks a lot to the, I don't know, kind of the culture you were stepping into. Yeah. Yeah. I that's mean, look, awesome. it's, it's the subtleties, right? Like it's the little things. Had I not got Rob Lemley and Lem was my producer on my audition who I got to work with, you know, after the fact, after I got the job, you know, Lem was a really good producer and I kind of lucked out. Like I had someone really good in my ear mm -hmm. in that chair. And, you know, I had some, it, you just think about stuff like that. Cause I could have maybe gotten a producer that wasn't as strong as, as Lem, or maybe didn't understand how to work with me. Um, so like, there was definitely some good stuff that had happened. Um, you know, but look, candidly, I was looking to leave, you know, after a couple of years, you know, that system is specific, uh, to certain people and their personalities. And, you know, I loved my time there for a lot of reasons. And there were some things that I didn't totally care for either. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I ended up, everything happens for a reason. It's a statement that I hate hearing in life. Um, and I hate actually saying it cause I used to cringe when you, people used to tell me that, but it, there is a lot of truth to it. Like I never would have gotten the job at PAC 12 network had I not been at ESPN. And I don't know if I would have been ready for the job at PAC 12 network without ESPN. Cause you're put in mm -hmm. so many situations in live television that are so unique that you can't help, but get better and improve and feel confident that when you go to another network, like, no, I got it. It's cool. Like I've already done, I've been in those situations before. I know how to navigate and wiggle my way out of different, different circumstances that just might be rare at another network. So just like the sheer inventory of it all was just, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. That's interesting. And, you know, I think what you said about being ready to move on and looking for another experience, that's true of 
everybody in every profession. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you just find a place that you really gel or you see an opportunity to, I guess, advance or do what you really want to do within the system. And sometimes you don't. It's great that you had that opportunity. It made such an impact on you and your career and, and set you up for Pac-12. Um, then speaking of Pac-12, which you, I mentioned a little bit at the beginning and you talked about, you had an incredible career there. And I know that you've experienced a lot of changes with that within the last <laughs> year, but tell me a little bit about your time and your experience. Cause you were there from the beginning and that's not yeah. an opportunity. Many people in this business get to have. You hit the nail on the head and I'm insanely grateful for that experience because that was, I got to tell you the start of my time at PAC 12 was the best professional experience I've ever had. I got to tell you the end of it was probably the worst experience I've ever had in my mm -hmm. career, but the beginning was amazing. And I'm, I really am grateful. It's like a lot of personal friendships, relationships that I had there, being able to do the amount of shows and the types of shows, um, having a, a lot of autonomy. I, I, there's, I don't think I'll ever have a job ever again unless I'm working for myself, where I, I'll have that much autonomy. And they literally let me do whatever I want on that set. And it was amazing, 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 amazing. I love that aspect of the gig, but it was, you know, like it was roll up your sleeves. Like you, you did some stuff that was not necessarily, you know, part of the equation. Um, and on the job description at other networks when you were on air there and it was fine. I loved it, but being there from the beginning, you know, it's just, I'll give you a great example. When, when basketball season is going on at during like college basketball. So Don McLean was one of the lead analysts there. Lamar Hurd, one of our analysts there, Kevin O'Neill, like those guys I worked with primarily during basketball season, Matt Muehlbach as well. Basketball season's over. I'm still talking to those dudes all year long. Uh, I've, I no longer work there. I just talked to Don last week. I just talked to Lamar last week. A month ago, I talked to Matt, like you develop these friendships that didn't exist. When I worked at ESPN, when it was a season, like you deal with certain people and like you were cool with them. And then the season ended and you'd see them their next season. So like there was that difference. Football. I mean, Yogi Roth, one of those guys, Rick Newhaus. I mean, Rick, I, I got to be honest with you, man. Like, I don't, I don't know if I get as much rep, as many reps on ESPN U radio right now on Sirius XM. And if it's not for Rick. You know, Rick and I worked great together. He was, he and his wife, Stu, were like my West Coast family when I moved out, like my West Coast parents, you know? So when I lost my gig, he calls and he said, you know, he calls the bosses and say, hey, when Chris, who's his regular uh, co-host, when Chris isn't here, call Yam. You know, so like all of a sudden I'm getting a little bit more work. It goes back to those relationships. But, you know, you talk to these people all year. And I think that's part of the hard part about how it all ended. Um, you know, and that, that perspective is really different. But I, I got to tell you from a, professional experience, the autonomy. I love, I love doing those shows, um, getting to know people on those campuses and the coaches and the kids, you know, I spent so much time doing pro sports at ESPN. And then you get to the college side, you know, they're still kids, you know, like they don't, they don't really get how many people are watching and, you know, that they got the ch chance to be a pro athlete. Like they're just, there's like an innocence about it, which is always kind of cool, um, you know, to see them kind of grow up and then have success. I mean, it's always cool to see the kid who was a freshman and then just talk to them, not regularly, but occasionally during the year, during their season, and then see them that next year. And I, I can't even imagine what it's like for a coach who sees the development up close and over time. Whereas like for members of the media, you kind of sneak in every once in a while and you're like, oh my God, like the kid actually grew up a little bit and in a good way, right? Like they've just mm -hmm. kind of matured. So there's those aspects of, of the gig that I really enjoyed. Yeah, that's really great. And I, just to kind of give some context then, so you were with PAC-12 when it got launched and you've been with them since, and then COVID hit. And that's what you were talking about. COVID hits and there are no sports, yeah. right? And what do you do? And then sports start again, but nothing's really quite the same. Um, and that's kind of what happened with you and with PAC 12 and, and how you ended up in this new role. So tell yeah. me about those couple months because not easy. Cause like you said, you, you have yeah. relations. It's not even just about the job. You have relationships with people. And sure, so, so what sure. was that time like last year? Um, brutal, brutal, uh, hardest part from a, well, I, I shouldn't say, well, from a professional standpoint, it wasn't close. Like that was the hardest part I think I've ever had, um, to deal with in my life on a personal level, um, outside of, you know, 
family members and relatives passing away outside of that, like personally, it was, it's, it's been hard. I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said it still, you know, isn't difficult. I don't, I still live a couple blocks from the studio. I still kind of cringe sometimes when I'm in the car driving past that place. Um, like you said, look, I, I was expecting a contract extension, um, not a non-renewal. So to say I was blindsided um, is sort of the understatement of the year. And you kind of find out who your friends are and, and things kind of happening behind the scenes that you weren't aware of that I probably should have been aware of. Um, so, you know, like that stuff hurts because you feel like there's a betrayal, right? Like I know what I did from day one through the end of my tenure, but I also realized that the people who hired me day one, they no longer were at the network um, anymore. So I look, you know, I mean, who says it It goes well, right? When they get, when they lose their job, no one's going to say that. And I, I'm not going to say, cause I am upset, still upset to how, how it all played out. Um, you know, I, I, I candidly like, and, and maybe, maybe it's not even the right take. I just kind of wished they handled it differently. Like I felt mm -hmm. like I deserved a little bit more. Um, re I don't respect might not even be the right word. Like I, I just, I thought they effed up. Like I just, I yeah. felt like they did not appreciate any of the stuff that I did. Well, um, cause so it's not hard. just you as a person, it's what you've done for the network. Sure. Cause like you're saying, there was a lot of blood, sweat and tears that went into launching it. So I can understand how you had this different emotional connection with that place and where you'd been at with those people. No so doubt. it makes sense that it's hard to articulate that you felt a little, um, like you said, not, not necessarily disrespected, but a little like a lack of appreciation of the position you had and, and how long you had it with that network. Yeah, I would say that's a good way of describing it. Like the appreciation factor for sure. Like I do feel like I got stabbed in the back a little bit um, and betrayed maybe is maybe the more appropriate term to use <laughs> when, when discussing this, but you're right. Like the emotional thing is hard because it wasn't just sign up to be, you know, an anchor at the network. Like that's not what this was. And you know, like I said, I loved it. Um, you know, there were some things off air that I didn't love, but there was no place I'd rather be every single Saturday uh, during football season, Thursday and Saturday during basketball season than being on that set. You know, I, I, we used to have a joke. Um, one of our producers, Adam Stanko, who's a good buddy of mine, who I worked with at ESPN, and I got him to come out to the West Coast. And I, I would joke with him. And it was kind of a running joke over the years. It was like, no, we do the show for for us, for like our crew, like our crew working on this specific show. Like, don't worry about all the other noise. Because it, it kind of felt like sometimes, you know, like you were concerned about other things that you didn't have control over. So, you know, Donnie Mac would go on the set, like, you know, I was doing the show as good as I could for Don, um, you know, and Lamar, just the whole list. I don't want to like start naming names because then you start mm -hmm. forgetting people, which is not cool. But um, yeah, the emotional side of things is really hard. I, do I owe you a copay when this is done? How does that, how does that work? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad for you to express everything yeah. that you are feeling. No, it's, it's honestly, like, I think it's definitely, it's been hard and I think I'm getting better at getting over it. Um, and I shouldn't say getting over it, like accepting kind of what the reality is, but had it, had I not gotten work at NFL network, I got to tell you, like, I would be in a dark, dark place right now. Cause there was some dark <laughs> months during COVID trying to figure this out. I, I mean, I swear I have a whiteboard in my room and there's just names of people that I've worked with over my career. I mean, I was calling everyone, Hey, if you know, and like, there was no work. Like, where was that work? Like, there was no sports going on for a good stretch of that time. And, and it goes back to relationships, you know, like I, I had developed some relationships at ESPN with some folks and there was someone at NFL Network and, um, you know, he had kind of gotten on a Zoom with me. And, and next thing I know, like they carve out a role for me at NFL Network. And I honestly, like I, 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 I said this earlier, I'm super, super lucky to even have that gig, but it's just nice, you know, like you get, I had the NFL draft this year, so I was with the Niners. And I got to tell you, like just people who I haven't even met, I haven't even been to their studios yet just because of COVID. So like everything I do is like literally right in this seat where I'm talking with you, you know, when mm -hmm. I work, unless I'm on the road, but it's just nice. Like people give a damn about the product, right? Like I get a text message like, oh, hey, great job on that hit. Or like people are watching and like they care. So like that's been really refreshing. That's been kind of one of the awesome things about, about being there. When you're talking about Pac-12 and, and kind of trying to move on from that these last few months, something that sticks in my head just in life in general is that it's often hard to let go of what you wish something was. 
And you wish that situation would have ended differently and you're grateful for where you're at now, but it can take a long time to let go of how you wish things had been. And it's, I think it's true at work. I think it's true in relationships that that's often that last hurdle that's hard to kind of get over, you know? I think that's a great way of describing it because we all signed up and saw the potential. Like we all saw what that place could be and i hope to god it gets there because i still have some friends that are working there on a regular basis and the reports that i read like are not necessarily the most flattering and the future of that place doesn't always look positive but i hope you know i got a new commissioner now so hopefully things gonna go in the right direction but to your point like lamar would say this to me all the time hey like we all see the potential like it's just they're just people got to want it people got to do the work and sometimes that just wasn't wasn't getting done so then you mentioned though, that things have been really positive so far at NFL network and obviously it's different, but I mean, overall, what has that experience been like for you? Cause you start, when did you start yeah. there? So, so my contract at PAC 12 was up, um, August 12th and I had signed my deal to kick up at the end of August. So, um, what is that? Like seven, eight, nine, 10, 10 months, something along those lines. Oh, yeah, I yeah. can do, the, I should be able to do the math faster. So roughly 10 months or so I've been with those guys. It's been great. And it, you know, what's really strange about it is it goes back to, I had mentioned this before, just relationships and how important they are. I haven't been to their studios down in Los Angeles. I have barely met anyone in person. In fact, other than a camera crew that I worked with, two camera crews that I had worked with and two different field producers, I've met no one from NFL Network in person. Like that is just wild to me that it's been 10 months and that hasn't happened, but what are you gonna do, right? Like it's still kind of COVID and, and you know, like there just hasn't been an opportunity for me to get down to the studio. So it's just kind of leaning in and doing the extra work. Like I get a producer, have work with them. Mm -hmm. Hey, like get on the phone and just kind of find out about them a little bit and just kind of get to know people um, is how I've had to do it. But it's been really, it's a unique experience for sure. Cause I think I would have a different take had it been normal, you know, like where I was like going to the studio and doing shows like that's um, might have been a little out. more of a culture shock yeah. to, oh, th- to walk in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Cause I think like the bigness of it, like that's the other thing that I've noticed. It, it reminds me of ESPN when it comes to resources. So if you make the analogy, like I always say this, when I was at ESPN, it was like going to public school, right? Like you just got, a ton of kids in there and it's just like really, really big. And when I got to PAC 12 network, it reminded me of what it was like to go to private Catholic school, which is what I did my entire life. So it's like smaller, you, you, you form more of like these intimate bonds with people and, and develop and cultivate relationships. And now at NFL network, it almost feels like a cross between the two because the resources are so big, but it's not as big as ESPN, but it's still bigger than PAC 12. So um, hopefully I can take some of the lessons that I learned at ESPN and PAC 12 and, and figure out, you know, the path for me at NFL network. There's gotta be pros and cons to both situations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it, like you'll experience this too, right? Like, cause you've been in different shops, like when you're down in Los Angeles, right? Like you're, you're working down there. It, it feels different, I think, depending on where you work, but I, I know myself well enough to know, like I, I do better in like dealing with people one-on-one, like small groups, like work for me. Um, mm-hmm. Do you ever uh, check out that podcast? Maybe it was, man, I don't know if I read it in a Malcolm Gladwell book or. Oh, you know, love Malcolm it. Gladwell. Yeah, there you go. There mm-hmm. you go. Um, so I don't know if it was a, if it was in maybe Blank or Outliers or Revisionist History, which is his podcast. But the point is like, so he had talked about this one thing, which I found fascinating because um, my mom works in higher education and he had said, hey, if you're the valedictorian I'm paraphrasing here. He said it way more eloquently or wrote it way more (laughs) eloquently than I'm about to say it. But basically it is, if you are the valedictorian of your high school class, you're better off going to a non-Ivy school, Ivy League school, because you'll long-term, you'll have more attention and more resources and basically a little less competition than you would if you were going to Harvard, Stanford, Mm -hmm. right? Because it's that whole, your whole class is just a bunch of, you know, valedictorians, right? Um, That are there. And then that kind of is what struck me because I think back and I'm like, damn, like had I gone to Syracuse, for example, and Syracuse is like a great broadcast school that's got multiple radio stations on that campus and an unbelievable track record of success of turning, you know, college kids into sportscasters, right? 
at Fordham, we're not nearly as big. We got one radio station on our campus, but I got to tell you, like I, my specific class, I think we had like four or five of us in our grade. I got to do everything. You know, I had internships when I was down in, in Manhattan. I got to, you know, host shows on a regular basis, got to call games. I got to do updates, like all these things that happen. Whereas I think if I went to a larger school, those opportunities might've come, but they would have been far less and maybe not nearly as frequent. So I do think getting back to that phrase, I hate like things happen for a reason. I do think that some things like that kind of fell into place for me. Yes. There's so much validity to what you said. And even it's great that you realize the value of your experience and what it gave you. Try my best. So try to piece it all together. And Lord knows I had a lot of time uh, in 2020 to figure out some of these things. I was in my head a whole lot. So it sounds like you've had a really great attitude and things hopefully will continue to go well as COVID restrictions ease and we find ourselves in more of a normal pace of life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's look, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get like workouts again indoors without a mask on. So I'm like, yo, let's awesome. go now that now we're getting back to reality here. So That's like the benchmark that. for you is being able to yeah. work out inside without a mask. If I can go to my, my boot camp without a mask on and run on a treadmill, uh, maskless that that's, that's, that's all I need. That's I'm a happy <laughs> right. camper now. Happy Good camper. to know. Yeah. Um, the other thing I had wanted to ask you about Mike, and you mentioned your mom a little bit, but, um, I have noticed a couple of pieces that you have written. You have such a beautiful story with regards to your family and um, the experiences your father had coming here from another country and being an immigrant. And the pieces that you wrote were really personal for you, I know. And basically talking about your family's experience and the hopes that we can all be nice people, right? So pivoting a little bit from sports, I wanted to ask you about that and kind of what prompted you, if there was anything in particular, to share your thoughts yeah. that you did? Well, I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, it's kind of interesting. A lot of the pieces recently have been more COVID reaction related, um, more specific to a lot of the attacks that are happening in the Asian American community. But you mentioned the immigration path of my my grandfather and my dad. Um, and on that side of the family, I think that was not, I mean, that was pre COVID. Like I, I remember writing that and, and I guess there was some COVID that was happening in overseas, but it hadn't made its course to, to the United States at that point. But there was a lot of coverage. Um, I guess it's like two years ago now on immigration policies and, and more specifically, the reason why I wrote it was there was a lot of separation that was happening between parents and their kids. And, you know, I was watching a lot of the news coverage and it was really bothering me. It was hard to see, and just envision what it must be like for a parent to not have their kid with them and a kid who's probably scared out of their mind to not have their parent around. So to me, there was a conversation that really lacked a lot of compassion on that subject. And I did not want, look, I think if anyone goes to social media, you post something that's politically real, you know, related to, to politics, you're going to get crushed, both, you know, whatever. And the other mm-hmm. side's going to kill you. If you say something the other way, the other team's going to kill you, whatever the case may be. So I, I didn't want to write something that was preachy or t- telling someone how to think. That's just not where it was. I just wanted someone to think about, you know, another side of this story, you know, how someone could be really desperate in their current home and feel the need to go and pick up and leave everyone they know and maybe not even speak a language and go to a foreign land just for the prospects of having a better life. And to me, like, I I just wanted to just sort of shed a light on, on some of that stuff. And I thought, because, you know, just if I could put a face to it and the short story is basically my grandfather who was in Hong Kong uh, and that's where my family's from. Um, my grandfather got a job as a sailor, uh, knowing that a ship was going to come to the United States and it docked in Baltimore and just never got back onto that boat and was basically, it was illegal here for the time being and did everything that he could to try to get citizenship, which he was ultimately able to do. He got the help of an attorney and, and things like that to try to, to make that happen. And eventually was able to bring, you know, my, my grandmother, my dad, my aunt and uncle to the United States. But, you know, that, that's like not like I, I just think about the challenges that he faced, right? And like that wasn't like a, a one year process. Like he was separated for like 10 years, you know? So wow. I just think about like the development, you know, of like my dad not having his dad around for the bulk of his childhood, my aunts, my uncles, like the whole thing. And then they come to the United States and like they were living in, in poverty in Hong Kong and they they didn't have a lot of cash. 
Um, you know, and it's kind of crazy because I was telling someone the story the other day when I lived in New York, you know, I was, you know, just graduated college. Like I would go out with my friends, like everyone else would. And there was a, a couple bars in lower Manhattan that I would, you know, go with my buddies. And I'll never forget. I went out to dinner one night with my dad and he's like, Oh, I want to show you something. So we're driving around lower Manhattan. He goes, Hey, we used to live here. We used to have like our apartment. I was like, what do you mean you used to live here? And he's like, Oh, you know, our first home was in this apartment building. And, and I was like, Oh, what was that like? And he's like, Oh, it was a one bedroom. And we all kind of like shared space. And there was, you know, five, of us kind of hanging out and that was not easy. And I was almost embarrassed, right? Cause here I am 21, 22, having a good time with my friends, literally right around the corner. Uh, and I can guarantee you, my dad wasn't going to that bar, um, or any bar, right. Cause he was, you know, trying to figure out like the English language he was trying to, you know, he was working, he was a bus boy cause they needed income. So things like that. Like, I just think about the opportunities that I've had, in life because of some of those sacrifices. So I think, God, I don't even know where you started down asking about why, why I wrote it. It really was because it was very difficult for me to see the separation that, that kids were having from their parents. And then fast forward, the, the more of the pieces now are just like, dude, like you don't deserve to get your ass kicked because you're Chinese on the street. And mm -hmm. um, that oh, there's been a lot of that that's been happening and living in San Francisco and seeing the attacks here and in New York, you know, you just kind of get worried for, you know, your family members, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in New York, cause they're still there. And, um, candidly, like I don't walk around the streets anymore, San Francisco with AirPods on, like, I always feel like I'm a little bit more on edge lately. So it just, it's a, it's a, been a, a weird time for sure here. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, so much to say, I think to that answer you just gave, I, first of all, that's incredibly sad. I, and I don't know even really how to articulate that because it's not, you know, the fact that you don't feel safe and don't feel comfortable and that you're doing those little things because, you know, you feel like you need to be aware of your surroundings is yeah. really unfortunate that that's kind of what's been happening the last few months. Um, which I mean, I mean, longer term than that, but it has felt heightened the last few months sure. on the flip side. I have such a deep um, respect and appreciation for how you speak of your family and your father and your grandfather. Um, very similar stories of how some of my relatives ended up in the United yeah. States. And I love, I love hearing about that. I love hearing about other families' stories because that was the American dream for a lot yeah. of people and yeah. being able to do that and to provide for your families. And I, you said that you felt guilty because you were living this great life and your dad was showing you where he had come from, I would say you were doing exactly what he wanted you to do in a sense and exactly yeah. what your grandfather wanted you to be able to do. And that's why they came here because they wanted you to get to have this experience and look at the incredible things that have come from it. Look at the things you've been able to do with your life and the people that you've reached and that you've touched. So again, I, I just love and have such a, a sense of respect for your family's story and how you choose to share it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And actually it's, great insight. And I really appreciate you even saying that because I hadn't thought about it in those terms. Um, you know, when I think about the experiences that they were probably hoping for, for, you know, their grandkids, their children, their great grandkids and the whole thing. Um, so it is good. It's definitely a good way to, uh, to, it's good to hear something along those lines. And I, and I appreciate it. And I think too, you know, like what you're saying, like that is such a common theme, you know, and I think the one thing that it kind of surprised me is when I had posted it on social media, the amount of people that would message me and say, Oh my God, like that's how my, well, not exactly, but like, Hey, my family, mm -hmm. they had, we had immigrated from here and you know, like the opportunities that we had and the sacrifice, like, you know, if someone said to me, you know, let's just say in this ulterior universe that all of a sudden, like our country was going to, to hell and we needed to leave because it was just unsafe. And we ended up like, I don't know if I'd have like the cojones to, go to a country that I don't know, don't speak the language and then have to figure it out. Like that is, mm -hmm. man, that is like ballsy. Like, I just yeah. don't think I would, I don't know. Maybe I would, I have no idea, but my God, I'd be like scared out of my mind to have to, to, you know, undertake a situation like that. So, um, but I think, you know, obviously your family, my family, I, I would imagine a lot of families that are, you know, people who are listening to this, their families had a, a really similar experience. It's crazy to think about, to your point, what it yeah. took for somebody to make that decision, not just for themselves, sure. but for the people they were responsible for, which is why I just, I love, I love hearing those stories because I think they're just really beautiful and inspiring and 
are, are good stories to tell. So thank you for kind oh, of, yeah. you know, opening up a little bit about your family. Um, uh, before you go, I yeah. have a new list that I've been doing of kind of closeout questions. Oh, I okay. have developed a little bit of a inside the actor studio formula with my okay. final questions that I've been asking everybody. And I did it with Ashley Adamson first. Okay. She was my first person. I test drove it on and people have been very opinionated about their answers. Oh, like it okay. seems to stir up a lot of very deep thoughts. So, I mean, I shouldn't say this cause I don't want to throw you off. They're very simple questions. Rapid answer. <laughs> first thing that comes into your head. Okay. No, I mean, it's really, I'm sorry. I've teed this up now for you in a very dramatic way, but it's really supposed to be no pressure. Now I'm so nervous. Don't, <laughs> no, don't be too intimidated. Okay. Although I need to, I have it written in a specific order so that it's always the same. Okay. So now I need okay. to find my specific order. Okay. Are you ready? I hope so. I don't <laughs> think I have a choice. So, <laughs> Question one, what makes you smile? Oh man. Um, this is going to sound really sappy. Am I supposed to go super fast? Um, so if I, if I am, I mean, I'll just uh, say like human speed. It's okay. Human speed. Okay. Um, <laughs> honestly, when I see cute kids on, on the street, like no matter what, like if they're wearing something silly or, you know, like they're giggling about something, I gets me every single time I will smile to that. Oh, that's a good one. No, right, okay. I'll take it. All right. So pressure's on that's and I delivered one. at least on the first one. Okay. You did great. <laughs> okay. Number two, what is your favorite word? Oh my God. Um, you know, what really bothers me about this is this came up on a radio show that I just did the other day. And one of my good friends and my co-host guy Haberman said dossier is one of his favorite words because there Whoa. was like, yeah, it's like an ASU thing with the dossier that's there and an investigation. So I'm like, oh, that's a really good one. Um, I'm really Pretty simplistic. One. It is, it, it, <laughs> but like, it sounds good. There's, there's just like a lot of, lot of goodness there. Um, yeah. If this was family feud, I would have clocked out at this point. So mine's so like, I would love to say I was like really mature and didn't automatically think of a four letter word. That's not appropriate as my favorite word. Um, and the people that have worked with me will tell you that it's definitely a word that comes out of my mouth a whole lot. Um, I will, I don't, yeah, I don't, that's like not a good one to throw out that way. Um, can I oh, pass for now and circle back? Cause I, <laughs> like, cause I can't steal dossier. Yeah. Right. Cause like, that's a really good one. You don't one. want to, but I, I don't, don't want to want either. To. And like, I can't say the F you. word. Cause like, that's not, I mean, cool you either. can say the F word. I mean, you can say the F word. I try to be family friendly. So I would, if you said the actual F word, I might yeah. leave you out. No, that but I wouldn't you can do. say the do. F word. If you feel really passionately about that, like it's your go-to that could be, I mean, or I can come back. I can come yeah, back. let's come back. And I, I guarantee I won't have a better answer than that, but at least it buys me like on the 2% chance I do come up with something better. I'll have it. Okay. I'm not coming up with anything better. <laughs> my best though. <laughs> Number three is what is your favorite smell? Oh, um, oh, I got this one. Um, as I look to my right at my wine fridge. Um, so, so there's, there's a couple different wines that I certainly love to smell. Um, there's one in particular. So I don't know if this is my favorite one, but it's the one that I can think of that's really unique. So there's a 2012 bottle of Syrah. And I actually like Syrah is not even my favorite varietal. Um, there's a 2012 bottle of Syrah that's sitting in my wine fridge right now from a winery that got me into wine. And it's that specific bottle. I had never, it's got like this tobacco kind of smell to it. Um, and I had never experienced something along those lines. I typically, like I love Malbec um, and there's some cabs that I really like, but the smell of it, um, uh, yeah, so I would say the 2012 red car Syrah, the smell is, yeah, that'll also get me to smile by the way too. So, yeah. So that is a fantastic answer. And I'm sure there are going to be people who will listen to that and have a deep appreciation for it. I feel bad because this is actually the second time you've mentioned this wine to me. I am the absolute last person on the planet that could one understand what you're saying. I don't know anything about you what could. you just said. I don't no, know any could. of what you're talking about. Um, I'm so sorry because I I'm happy for you that it brings up a happy memory. I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything about wine or any kind of alcohol at all. Really Greeks are more eaters than drinkers. And I yeah, yeah. am wildly uneducated. No, you're, you're, in that you can area. get there though. You can get there. When I got the job in San Francisco at PAC 12 network, <laughs> 
I'd never drank wine at all. I didn't like the taste. I thought it was stupid. It it was like crazy to me. I was still drinking Captain and, and Coke, which by the way, I still do enjoy a little Captain and Ginger at a special occasion, um, you know, and some beers and the whole thing. And have you, have you been to Napa or Sonoma? No. Okay. That'll because change your life. that's where wine people go. Because no, no, no. I, but it's beautiful. Like, well, honestly, I, it took I can one trip that. there. And I think oh. it's very interesting to learn about, but I don't, oh, yeah. I was, and listen, I was also the designated driver in all situations in college. I oh, really, we should definitely I go to Sonoma then. <laughs> <laughs> You're driving. <laughs> No, honestly, yes. it's you, you would, you'd honestly, you would love it. I knew nothing about it and it just kind of slowly built up. And now it's like one of my favorite things. Okay. So. I have friends who are going to listen to this and I can guarantee you that they will think it is hilarious because they will know she doesn't oh. know anything, but I'm no, really glad. I'm glad for you. I'm glad that you have a happy memory. I'm that's awesome. Yeah, I'm yeah. really happy for you <laughs> that it has a happy <laughs> connection for you. Yeah. I would. Yeah. That's, um, I'm just, Sounds patronizing, by the way. Like no, you think I'm like I, some snooty wine guy. You're no, like, oh, I'm I don't. so glad you have a happy I, memory and the whole thing. I do but, because I yeah. can appreciate that. I, I can appreciate that. Um, I know way more about different kinds of feta cheese than most people probably oh, ever yeah. will I'm in their a feta life. Guy. Yeah. See, see, well, there you go. But like Let's, honestly, what your your feta cheese, there's gotta be a wine that goes great with it. So we'll <laughs> figure that out and I'll find I'll do the research on that one. I'll let you know. Okay. I'll be waiting like, for yeah, that whatever okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> question four um what song always fires you up oh uh no this one um very easy lose yourself eminem used to listen to that before every game that i called when i was in college not once not twice probably about a million times if it comes on i still just kind of like stop and immediately i can like feel like this visceral reaction of like just just getting there it always pumps me up so lose yourself eminem Awesome. What's yours, by the way? Do you, oh, God. Do you... you know, Ashley did the same thing. She was like, well, tell me yours. And I'm like, okay, reporter lady. Sure. I'll tell you what mine is. Um, reporter man. Uh, all-star smash mouth. Oh, yeah. Lifelong You're an all-star, number one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would also say, I told her number two was also Get Back by Ludacris. You, Cause okay. I can't not feel like when I listen to it, but. Yeah. Yeah. No, Luda, Ludacris. Yeah. That, Eminem's, Eminem's right up there though. That's. That's a solid choice. Yeah. I mean, because the, the question was like, gets you going, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, I mean, Eminem's not my favorite artist. No. You know, if I hear I like Biggie, it's on at that point. <laughs> so like there's that, you know, it depends on you. It was a very specific question. So, it was a specific question. Yeah. And that was intentional because you could talk about music in a hundred different ways. So I thought, yeah. what is like the hype, get you going oh, song? Hype train. Yeah. yeah. You did great. Okay. Uh, next, what is the most rebellious thing you did as a teenager? Wow. Um, I, I really, <laughs> this is going to make me sound so lame. I don't have a good answer That's okay. for that. That's okay. No, like legitimately. I, now I kind of feel like a dork that I don't have a good answer. You know, I, I honestly, I didn't really get in a whole lot of trouble growing up. Like I was yeah. kind of the kid who followed, I should stop talking. Cause now I'm realizing like, this Listen, is, yeah, I was the designated yeah. driver girl. Oh, Definitely yeah. I know who I'm talking to. From. Yeah. So like I didn't Definitely do. Understands. Yeah. There it's is okay. one thing which I'm not willing to share on air Um, that probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't sound. It sounds like yeah. everything you're saying is like a facade then. Like, no, 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 no. Because it's literally like the one thing, but my parents are both still alive. So I kind of want to just hold that one for, for <laughs> hopefully years and years and years to come. But <laughs> okay, that's. I can respect yeah, that. I don't, I don't need like one of my buddies listening to this and then you know, throwing that. I mean, I'm think about that, right? Like I'm almost, I'm 39. So I'm still worried about how my parents. Okay. Then I would agree. You probably that. should keep that locked down. Yeah. I yeah we'll just, I you know, maybe like life. when I get to like, you know, hopefully they're still alive when I'm 60. So like maybe at that point, like I've aged out of any, I feel like I have aged oh. out of any sort of punishment. I just don't want them knowing, you know, it's just like, it's eh. okay. I understand, yeah. but I'm going to make sure I know you for a long time, Mike, because I'm going to want to know this someday. <laughs> I'm for sure going to want to done, know what you're talking done, about. Done. Okay. Yeah. And you, you'll be able to, I'll tell you the story and you'll pick the wine because you will be at that level. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's odd. Well, I don't remember where I was. Oh, what is one of your guilty pleasures? Oh, um, there's definitely a few. So there's some TV shows. Um, Give like me one wine, of your for like sure. ice cream. My God, I can, that's like all day, every day. 
Um, I just randomly, are you a, I don't know what your favorite fla- flavor is. I've always been like a Rocky road kind of guy Ooh, I don't the other day. You know, okay. And me do I, if it's cold yeah. and creamy, I'm yeah. ready to go. But the, uh, this is going to make me really sound like a dork. So uh, I was at uh, the grocery store the other day and a little, cra- a little crazy for Friday night for me. Um, like, uh, what was it? Um, uh, Turkey Hill is the brand and it's uh black cherry ice cream. Okay. Have you had, oh my God. Yeah. Like the chair, like literally I'm like scooping out, like doing the whole cherry thing. Like I have trail mix right next to my computer right now. I can mm-hmm. guarantee you in a week, it'll be just peanuts. Cause all I do is just pick out the chocolate and it's like, <laughs> it's like, what am I doing? Just go and buy chocolate, trying to be like healthy with peanuts and protein and yeah. the whole thing. So I would say like ice cream, uh, a ton of wine. There's some bottles that I wish I'm so glad I have them, but I probably spent a little bit more money than I should have on them. So I would say like wine for sure. I'm a big gadget guy, like cool tech. Okay. So yeah, those would be guilty pleasures for me. That's all respectable. I will say California has like my favorite ice cream. So it's down South though, salt and straw. Have oh, you ever I've had heard a... of that. Oh, I got to check that out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, and, and coffees too, like different type of coffee that I like. Yes. So. See, that's my, that's again, something else that's a little bit more my language than the okay. wine world. Um, pancakes or waffles. <laughs> Someone just asked me this question yesterday. It's an important question. It is. Um, it's the type of pancake that we're talking about. So is it chocolate chip? Is it blueberry? Is it just plain? Is <laughs> it's it- It's whatever you want it to mochi be, Mike. Pan- All right, if it's mochi, mochi pancakes in, it's not I'm close. Gonna, oh yeah, you got to check I've that out. I've had a mochi pancake. Oh, that, they'll change your life. They will. Okay. It's like eating cake. So um, I will, I'll lean pancakes. If you can throw a little like, chocolate chip deal in it. Yeah. You got me. Okay. Good to know. Um, what are three things you must do every day? Uh, shower, brush my teeth and no, um, like you're talking like non-essential things. No, they can be, some people are very passionate about dental hygiene. So if brushing your teeth is one, you can totally keep that. No, like, all right. Besides like the obvious stuff like that, I'll, I'll say, Um, oh, here we go. If I don't feel right, I don't do it every day, but if I don't get some sort of physical activity in, I get like, like my, I just don't feel right. So Mm -hmm. I love going to my boot camp. So that would be one, um, two checking my phone, um, at stock prices, uh, would be two. There's a lot of that going on, which I probably should doing, be doing less of. And, um, just, I would say finding something sports related that I'm checking in on. Like those would be the three things that I, I do every day, every day that's happening. Well, I wish I was Stocks working out guy. every day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of worried about retirement and the whole thing. So, okay, dude, I am, I, I don't even want to listen back to this thing. Cause I am sounding like I'm 80 and a loser. <laughs> the more this <laughs> no. podcast is going on, these questions are, no. they're like loaded. Like you, I, I, I mean, think about that. I can't tell you anything like rebellious that I ever did in my entire life. Um, I'm coming up with like checking stocks as like a thing that I need to do. There's like, you know, it's like, oh, again, yeah, you got like expensive I, bottles I, of wine. It's like, what the hell, Mike? All right. <laughs> I did tell you that they seem to really stir up a lot of feeling. That was yeah, my you know, only You did say that. Is, you did say that. Yeah. yeah uh, last question then. Okay. If you were not a sports broadcaster, what would you be doing? which you kind of talked about earlier, but I don't know if that would still be your answer. Yeah, I don't, well, look, I didn't cut it on the pre-med track, so I wish I could say that, that wouldn't be the case. Um, I would say something, I would, honestly, I'd probably end up teaching um, at some point. I'd probably be kind of just, you know, I, I don't know if it would be, well, I guess if I wasn't a broadcaster, does that mean I never was? Because then I couldn't teach broadcasting. Or um, does that mean I well, don't get a job ever again and all I can do is teach broadcast? Oh my gosh, you are really thinking <laughs> hard dark. about this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, if that's what you want to say, then let's pretend you were a broadcaster, but it's time for yeah. something new. What yeah. would you want to go do? Uh, like NBA teaching. player. Yeah. Or beach volleyball player or pro golfer. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Teach. I would probably be a teacher. Um, you know, or, do you mean God, like, like university level or like? Uh, yeah, I think I'd have to go that level as much as I love kids. Like I, I do, like, I feel like I would have a bigger impact on older, like people, 
um, if yeah. that makes sense. So I yeah. would lean towards that direction. I think I'd be better, better suited for something like that or just like anything creative. Um, yeah. Like, you know, just sort of like anything like in the story world, like that would be kind of fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I have to I say this right. was all, you did awesome. Did you okay, want to change was your, on. did you want to change favorite your favorite word answer? No, or you no just I'm just going to pretend it. like I didn't, didn't hear the question. We could just move on from it. Okay. Yeah. Maybe um, I'll text you. I'll come up, like, I'll go through like a thesaurus. Thesaurus now is my favorite word. Done. All right, cool. I got one in there. I don't know if that helps you out any in the worried about being old category, by the way, but I know, I know. We'll just let I it know. be. Yeah. This was yeah. very insightful though. And I have to say, I don't think I've probably ever in my life had a conversation as long as that one about wine. So this was even a first oh, for yeah. me today. Here we go. It's the exposure. Yeah. You just need to be exposed to a little bit and then you'll be good. I'm going to yeah. find out the wine because I don't, I'm not a big cheese eater. You like feta. I'm going to find the wine that pairs well with feta. I know it exists. I just don't know what it is. So once I do, I will let you know. <laughs> okay. I hope your friends are going to push you to this. So. Uh, no, I, it's, it's been a long enough time period. I think that they've just, you know, okay. Here's the other thing though about that yeah. calorie allotment. I want the ice cream. I want the ice cream. And that's always yeah, what I would choose. Fair. Yeah. You that's, know? There's some days though, like, cause you haven't found the right wine. Like there are some days I... where I do the same thing. First of all, like you're too young to be thinking about calorie allotment. Trust me. Cause that, that's the conversation now I need to have with myself. Um, there are days where I'm like, all right, it's either the wine or the ice cream. And some days I'm just like, no, like I, I gotta have, like, there's been some days like you just finish up. I'm like, dude, we're open in the bottle. Like that's, that's what it is. Like I need, I want that specific glass of wine. So okay, you're on it. You're on it. I'll, yeah. I'm going to make this happen. I don't know how, but I'll figure it out. Okay. So. I'll be waiting. Like I said, well, thank you so much. It was so much fun to get to speak with you and yeah. hear about your different career experiences and your perspective on things. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do this today. And I just, I really had so much fun. Yeah, well, I appreciate the invite. Um, hopefully we get to do this again soon. And the next time we do it, we'll both have a glass. And um, I wish you nothing but success. Seriously, like I'm, oh, I'm thrilled to see kind of where, where the journey takes you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, look, have a great one. Um, appreciate the thank invite. You. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good All one. Right, Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks again for listening to this episode of In the Game with Elliot. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Also, check out In the Game with Elliot on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or watch full episodes on the YouTube channel.